Now, from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Good evening. Welcome to the World Over Live. Osama bin Laden is no more, and anti-Christian violence rages on in Egypt. Just what is the state of global jihad in the post-bin Laden world? And why is there such an uptick in the persecution of Christians in the Middle East? especially in Egypt. Dr. Walid Fares and Nina Shea are here to discuss. And later, we'll talk about some news items and the pursuit of happiness, or the lack thereof, with Father Jonathan Morris, the Fox News contributor and author of God Wants You Happy. We'll see. I'll also bring you a little preview of the newly released film, There Be Dragons, about the life of St. Jose Maria Escriva. If you'd like to be part of the show, the number is 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally 205-271-2980. Or just drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. Lots to get to, so let's do it. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. Another deadly assault on Christians in Egypt to report. Armed with guns and Maltov cocktails, a mob of 3,000 Muslims attacked three Coptic churches and neighborhoods in Cairo. After 14 hours, the all-night rampage claimed the lives of 12 cops. Another 232 were wounded. The assailants were identified as members of the Islamic Salafi movement. According to reports, the Salafis went to St. Mina's church to look for a Christian girl whom they believed was hiding there. The mob thought the girl had converted to Islam to marry a Muslim and now wished to revert back to Christianity. They also circulated a rumor that the girl was being tortured inside the church. After setting St. Mina ablaze, the mob then destroyed two other churches in the suburbs as well as homes and businesses of the Coptic faithful. Coptic Orthodox Bishop Anba Theodosius decried the situation. He said, we have no law or security. We are in a jungle. We are in a state of chaos, end quote. I'll have more about the plight of these Christians in Egypt and throughout the Middle East in our next segment. And a decision by the U.S. Navy to perform and host same-sex marriage ceremonies at its chapels has been put on hold for the present. On Monday, Rear Admiral Mark Tidd announced homosexual couples would be allowed to marry at Navy chapels in ceremonies performed by Navy chaplains as part of the repeal of the government's don't ask, don't tell policy. Among the potential problems with these maritime marriages, they would violate the Defense of Marriage Act, which defines marriage as the union of one man and one woman. Rear Admiral Tidd suspended his decision made just one day prior his reversal was likely fueled by pressure for some, from some 60 House Republicans who signed a letter objecting to the new policy. And the Republican Party has its first official candidate for president. As former House Speaker Newt Gingrich formally announced his bid for the White House, the recent Catholic convert took to the Internet for the long-anticipated announcement with posts on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Where else? Gingrich touted his record as House Speaker and his work with Ronald Reagan in the two-minute clip. Gingrich spearheaded the GOP takeover of the House in 1994. His tenure as Speaker was marked with both success and turbulence. He eventually resigned from the post in 1999 after losing support among House Republican members. And potential GOP presidential candidate Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels signed into law some of the nation's tightest restrictions on abortions, making Indiana the first state to cut off funding to Planned Parenthood. The nation's largest abortion provider will lose around $3 million annually in public funds. The law also bans abortions after the 20th week of pregnancy, unless there's a substantial threat to the woman's life or health. Planned Parenthood immediately sought a court order to prevent the public funding ban. The court denied their request on Wednesday. 
Another Catholic has been asked to serve as chaplain for the U.S. House of Representatives. Speaker John Boehner has nominated Jesuit Father Patrick Conroy as the next House chaplain. Father Conroy has served as a parish priest in Washington State, a chaplain at both Georgetown and Seattle University, and is currently a teacher at the Jesuit High School in Portland, Oregon. A vote on Father Conway, his nomination rather, is expected later this month. Uh, Conroy, I, I'm mixing things up. See, I spend a little time in Rome, it all goes to pot. If elected, he will become only the second Catholic to hold that post. Father Daniel Coughlin retired last month after serving 11 years as house chaplain. And the bishops of the Philippines have ended talks with President Danino Aquino over his continued support of proposed reproductive health and population control measures at issue, the so-called Responsible Parenthood Reproductive Health and Population Development Act, perennial legislation that has failed each year for about the last decade. According to reports, even though the legislation failed to pass the end of the legislative session in March, President Aquino will implement his own Responsible Parenthood plan without legislative approval. Monsignor Juanito Figura, the general secretary of the Bishops' Conference, said the bishops do not see any reason to further undertake a serious study or dialogue with the president. The measure, he said, promotes comprehensive sex education, sterilization, and artificial contraception. As secularist, materialist, individualistic, and hedonistic measures. And the Vatican is set to release two important documents in the coming days. The first is a set of uniform guidelines for bishops on how to deal with cases of priestly sexual abuse of the young. Prepared by the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, the document will be offered as a model for other, or and every rather, diocese around the world. It is designed to help bishops and then their conferences prepare their own guidelines. And also to be released, the long-awaited new instruction for implementing sum Sumorum Pontificum, the papal decree which encouraged broader use of the Latin Mass, the traditional Mass. Universe Ecclesiae is expected to strengthen the call by Pope Benedict to make the traditional liturgy available to the faithful in every diocese. Reportedly, the document will make clear that pastors do not need their bishop's permission in order to celebrate the Latin Mass. I recently spoke to the prefect of the Apostolic Signatura, Cardinal Raymond Burke, in Rome about the new instruction. Here's what he had to say in an exclusive interview. Sacred worship, which is the highest expression of our life in the church, is, has a beauty and an integrity of its own. And the way that we, we worshiped practically from the time of St. Gregory the Great until the reforms after the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council is a great treasure for us and has a beauty which appeals yet today. And that's evident because many of the people who are, who are attending, participating in the Mass according to the extraordinary form are young people who never knew it, mm -hmm. but they, they're attracted to it, they see a beauty in it that is, it, it, it's simply there, it's a reality, it's an objective reality. So the Holy Father has said we cannot uh, pretend or, or, or actually hold that there's anything wrong with that form of the Mass. And so that he's asked that, uh, that it be celebrated together with the ordinary form, not calling into question its validity and, and its own beauty, mm -hmm. and with the hope that with the celebration of the two forms there would be a mutual enrichment. And relief efforts continue in Alabama and across the South after the devastating storms and tornadoes of April 27th. This past week, Pope Benedict XVI expressed grief and sent his prayers to the southern states impacted by the storms. They claimed the lives of over 340 people. The Pope also encouraged uh, and offered his encouragement to families as they begin the task of reconstructing their communities and their lives. To that end, EWTN has joined relief efforts organized by Bishop Robert Baker of Birmingham, offering both financial and organizational support, and some of our employees have even volunteered in the tornado-stricken communities. The destruction is truly unimaginable. To support the relief efforts in EWTN's home diocese of Birmingham, please go to the Birmingham Diocesan website, BHM diocese.org. That's bhmdiocese.org.
And if you're planning a trip to D.C., why not experience the world over in person Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern? Drop us an email at worldoverdc at yahoo.com and we'll reserve a seat for you. Up next, Dr. Walid Farah and Nina Shea join us to discuss the religious persecution in the Middle East and global jihad. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. She is the director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute here in Washington, D.C. He is the author of the book, Coming Revolution, Struggle for Freedom in the Middle East, to discuss the plight of Christians in the Middle East and the continuing threat of jihad. Would you welcome Nina Shea and Dr. Walid Ferris? Thank you both for being here. Thank and and uh, uh, it's great to have you both together. In Egypt, we see this violence rising. It, it is continuing in ways I don't think anyone imagined. We thought with the new spring, uh, the Egyptian spring, that this would somehow bring a relaxation in these tensions. That doesn't seem to be the case. It's been a cruel spring for the cops, the Coptic Orthodox Christians of mm -hmm. Egypt. Uh, they have been hit by rampages of extremists, um, Muslim groups that have been whipped up by extremists, by rumors. Um, and they've gone out, uh, these, these gangs have gone out and, and burned their churches. Uh, they've killed people. Uh, uh, they've chased a governor, a Christian governor, out of his seat. Um, and now they're fleeing. I mean, we have reports that they're actually, the cops are leaving. This is their country. The cops are the only remaining Christian population of, of, any of size, size in mm -hmm. the Middle East. And, and it's, in fact, it's the largest minority community, religious community, that's non-Muslim in the entire Middle East. There is about mm. 8 to 10 million of them. Mm. And if they go, this is a complete religious cleansing of the entire Middle East. It's very profound and mm -hmm. very worrisome for all of us. Dr. Ferris, I want to talk to you a moment about this group. Who are the Salafis? Who are these people? The Salafist jihadists are, in fact, the mothership of Al-Qaeda. These are those who have been Wahhabis, mm -hmm. uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Diobandis. They call for the reestablishment of the caliphate. They because these are the people who are initiating this violence and whipping up the, the, the crowds who burn these churches. These are the same people also in Baghdad have attacked the church. They call mm -hmm. themselves Salafis. Mm -hmm. These are the same people who have been, you know, uh, with the Taliban attacking religious minorities in Afghanistan. This is part of a large web of jihadists worldwide. And who is supporting them? Where is the money and the support coming from? Well, they fundraise, obviously, like many other organizations, but they and others have been funded in the past by petrodollars. When we say petrodollars, oil producing regimes from the Gulf, mm -hmm. and they boast about it. They have been in the past supported by Saudi Arabia, by Qatar, not directly for violence, but for their ideological enterprises and madrasas, and they use that to actually engage in ethnic cleansing against the Christians. That's remarkable. And we see this continuing. Even in Nigeria, I read a report, 17 people killed, including a pastor and his family family. And in that case, uh, again, it seems there's something organized here. This is an organized attack on these religious minorities. What is the end game? They don't have any serious political power. They're, they're, they're a mere percentage point or two of the populations. Why are they being targeted and, and, and driven out in such numbers? Well, this is an ideology behind this violence. It's an ideology of Islamism. And they want to erect uh, an Islamic state and a caliphate, as Walid said. Mm -hmm. um, this means that there's really no room for any other thought or religious practice. It's mm -hmm. a, a very uh, repressively conformist ideology of Islamic supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so we saw this in Iraq. Um, uh, in the last couple of years, half of that population of Christians, and Mandians and Yazidis, all the, all the non-Muslim minorities have been driven out with a lot of violence by the same movement, this Islamist movement of Salafi. And, and now we see in the Nigerian situation, and I, I spoke to Bishop Makram Gassis earlier mm -hmm. today, in Sudan there's the threat that Sharia law could be the, the law of the land in that mm -hmm. entire northern region, mm -hmm. in which case, as we're seeing in Nigeria, these people are simply driven out or, or subjected to this law. Is, are we going to see more of this? Well, the Salafi jihadists have made their intentions very clear. They have issued press releases, remember, mm -hmm. last December and January. But if you visit their websites and chat rooms, what they're talking about is basically the cleansing 
of non-Muslims, specifically the Christians, in the case of Sudan and the case of Nigeria, the areas in between the south and the north are under attack as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, places ahead, like Nigeria and Egypt, we've seen impunity. They are allowed to wreak havoc, burn churches, vandalize, kill Christians without ever being arrested or going to trial. And that has been a problem, a persistent problem in those countries under Mubarak, uh, the former regime in Egypt. So it's getting worse, but that is part of the problem. There is a reluctance on the part of these governments to prosecute these people. Now, the cops have been camping out in front of the U.S. Embassy, holding and staging protests, begging for some international cover and protection here. It seems they're getting a deaf ear. Uh, there, President Obama has said nothing so far about the cops in Egypt. Which, and, is, which is very ironic, Fina, because in his speech in Cairo, if yeah. you recall, mm -hmm. he mentioned the cops. Yes, so you mentioned yes. the cops and then you don't follow up on the situation. Yes, yes. I think there should be some reminder here. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, what do you think is going to happen here, Nina? I mean, are they just going to get crushed in this, in this uh, reformation? In this, I mean, are we moving to an Islamic state? I, I think um, there are forces that want to see an Islamic state in Egypt, yes. And I, I, I don't know if it'll uh, fully happen, but I think the cops uh, are so sizable that they're not uh, going to take it lying down. They're not just going to be driven out peacefully. They're going they to 10% of the population. They're 10 percent of the population. There's nowhere for them to go. You know, mm -hmm. the United States has not opened its borders to the Christians of the Middle East uh, mm -hmm. from, from Iraq in recent years uh, to any, any real numbers. Um, so they're going to demonstrate as they are. Um, they are using this, the little political space that's there to raise their voices. Um, and they're going to defend themselves. They've already started organizing in this Mbaba uh, district in Cairo right. that had the violence last week. And they, they've uh, started organizing defense groups. Walid, how important is this Christian minority in Egypt as a stabilizing influence for the erection of a credible democracy? Well, they are the most important because without them, the Islamists, the Salafists in this case, and I may add also mm -hmm. the Muslim Brotherhood, who are the other, you know, face of the Salafists, are going into the process of Islamizing Egypt and therefore moving it away from, you know, the path towards liberal democracy mm -hmm. to the path towards Talibanization. Mm -hmm. Let me add one point on the Muslim Brotherhood. They may not jump immediately and create an Islamic state. They know it's impossible. What mm -hmm. they are doing is to grab some seats in the next elections because they are the most uh, you know, organized mm -hmm. and then target not the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Education. Ministry of Information. If they control the Ministry of Education, 15,000 schools and colleges will become madrasas. And yes. that's your Islamic state. And Nina, you've been writing extensively about the uh, textbooks distributed even here in the United mm -hmm. States mm -hmm. by Saudi Arabia. I mean, mm -hmm. this is Saudi Arabian dollars creating these, these uh, textbooks. What is in them? Why are they so pernicious? Well, these are um, national curriculum, uh, the Islamic studies of Saudi Arabia. It's produced by the Ministry of Education there. And I was just in Saudi Arabia a couple months ago uh, talking to the Minister of Education, and they really are dragging their feet about reforming these things because they, what they say is that um, Christians and Jews are the enemies of the believer, meaning Muslims, mm -hmm. um, that apostates can have their blood spilled, meaning they can be killed with impunity. And mm -hmm. apostate is anybody who objects to their agenda, other Muslims. Well, it makes it easy that way, right? Everybody's an apostate. Yeah, including other Muslims, meaning, yeah. uh, right. as Medina said, the Salafists basically mm -hmm. are against the Christians, Jews, and also Muslims who don't go by their mm -hmm. ideas. I want to go to Tony from Rhode Island. Go ahead, Tony. You're on The World Over Live. What's your question? Yes, my question is, uh, the Obama administration, um, which tends to be socialistic in its uh, concepts, is it trying, do you think, to try to set up a, a, a block of socialistic Islamic countries in the Middle East? Um, and by doing so, are they contributing to the violence against Christians? Mm. I don't think that's the agenda there. I, I think that the president and his administration are very reluctant, though, to speak up for religious freedom anywhere. We're seeing this in China mm -hmm. as well. And uh, very uh, almost a, a cowed by political correctness, uh, a, a deferentiality to um, these Islamic extremists. Um, you know, we saw that with the burial at sea of bin Laden. Um, Which I want to talk about in a moment. Um, you know, I, I don't really understand it. I don't mm -hmm. understand why he's doing it, but I guess it's to try to... Do you want to take a crack at this? Uh, well, in Dr. addition to what Nina has said, which is true, mm -hmm. uh, you have the advisors of the administration, the academic, scholarly advisors of the administration, and you can read their narrative, you can read their research, and basically what they're saying is that our next partners in the Middle East are the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. So any critique of the Muslim Brotherhood would be the critique against the partners, so mm -hmm. that's why we don't see mm -hmm. much 
of the issue with regard to defense of the Copts and other minorities. Mm. Uh, I want to switch gears for a moment and talk about the death of Osama bin Laden. Uh, the, the special forces went in, the, the, the Navy SEALs did an incredible job mm -hmm. uh, in this operation. Went on for a long time, though, the observation of what was happening there. Clearly, somebody knew bin Laden was, was there and was protecting him. I mean, with the, with the Pakistani intelligence, how could... It's an insult to our intelligence that someone didn't know he was right under their nose the entire time. You know, in that business, uh, Raymond, if I'm bin Laden and walking into that compound when I came, mm -hmm. what, what would be the first question I'm going to ask my assistant? Who is protecting us here? Right. Well, that means that basically there is somebody within the national security intelligence apparatus not only knew about it, but provided security. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the higher levels. Basically, remember, there was the Musharraf government and right. then the People's Party government. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that those knew exactly where he was. They knew he was in Pakistan. Yeah. So that's what the question is today. Who? What is the long-term impact of his death? Is this... Because many people say, well, the war on terror is it's almost done. That's it. Well, I think it's an essential battle that had to be won. We had to get bin Laden, and it's a good thing we got him. But it's not over by any means. There's this ideology of Islamism on the march. It's, mm -hmm. it, it means that uh, there is people determined, they're willing to use violence to create Islamic State with no room for any other uh, religious faith. Well, it, you know, hi hi historically speaking, this is not bin Ladenism that we're fighting. Mm -hmm. We're fighting jihadism. Bin Laden was the product of the ideology, as Nina said, mm -hmm. but, you know, with his end, the ideology continues. You know, it's like the story of the Lord of the Rings. He is the Lord, he's mm -hmm. gone, the rings are here, that's the ideology. Ah, mm -hmm. ah interesting. Yeah, good. For the that's children, that would be important. That's a good analogy, that's right. My, my son suddenly <laughs> perked up. He's finally listening to Daddy's show. Um, let's talk for a moment about uh, the religious aspect of this. A great PR effort was made by the United States to show how sensitive it was to Muslim sensitivities, to Muslim practice. They washed the body, they buried it at sea. Your thoughts on the religious sensitivity exercised there, yet the absolute deaf ear given to these religious minorities that mirror the country we're talking about, mainly the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a, a real double standard, um, and it's actually not only goes against our values, it goes against our interests. Mm -hmm. Because if there is, um, if this prevails, if this ideology prevails, and if there is a, uh, an ethnic, uh, religious cleansing of these uh, non-Muslim minorities, the Christians, the Mandeans, others in, in, the, in the region, um, there will be uh, mm -hmm. a descent into extremism. There'll be nothing stopping it. Mm -hmm. um, these people have been moderators. They've been uh, educators. Uh, they've been mediators between the East and the West throughout history. This has been this region of the Middle East has been a crossroads of different civilizations and pluralism um, throughout the centuries. And they've lived side by side and coexisted through centuries. This is a land Christ lived in Egypt, which we often forget about. I mean, the, 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 these the, are indigenous the fled religions. There. These religions were founded in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jews, the Zoroastrians. I mean, there's a whole uh, mix of them. Mm -hmm. And for in, in our on our watch in our generation. Um, we may be seeing the end of it. It's, it's frightening. It, it is frightening. It's frightening. I want to go to the phones. Dr. Shaker, uh, what is your question? Well, it's not a question. It's a comment okay. about what Nina just mentioned about the number of the Christians, which unfortunately is uh, something been going on and on for many years, that they try to undermine the number of the Christians in Egypt uh -huh. And they say it is 8 to 9 million. The fact it's over 16 million, and this is based on the statistics from the church uh, baptismal uh, certificate, uh, marriage certificate, this certificate. So the church is having their own synthesis, which is made over 16 million. Mm -hmm. And this is was the first uh, uh, confrontation between Bob Shenouda and uh, Sadat back in early 70s, like 72, 73, uh, when they tried to publish the census at that time, saying the number of the cops is 2 million, which is only one district in Cairo, which is Shobra, which is mostly uh, a Christian uh, district over there. 
Very sure. good. Well, let, let's leave it there because I don't want to run out of time, Dr. Shaker. But it, well, might they be underestimating these numbers? They may be. I mean, uh, Wally can Christians. speak to this better than I can, uh, coming from there. But it, these are these demographics are treated like state secrets over there. They don't mm -hmm. take uh, polls about how many. Mm -hmm. They don't have free flow of information. So we don't really know. It could yeah. be well be 15 million. Yeah. Well, well, we may also factor in the diaspora of the cops. So mm -hmm. with two million, we have half a million in America, another mm -hmm. half a million in Australia. So this may be the numbers. But think of even an eight million or nine million. We're talking twice the size of the entire Palestinian population. Mm -hmm. There is one million people in Shobra, as he said, in Cairo mm -hmm. or Zabia Hamra, versus one million people in Gaza, total population of Gaza. Mm -hmm. So why is this focus on, you know, what, when issues happen in Gaza and the West Bank, mm -hmm. for example, and we should, yeah. and nothing when it happens in, in Egypt. Yeah, there, there's a blind eye really being mm -hmm. turned to this situation. And I, it reminds me, Nina, as, even as you report it and you read these, these, these stories, it feels an awful lot like the Iraqi Christian situation. Well, that's what's so frightening, because we know what has happened to them. Half of them have been driven out, and they may not, never be able to reconstitute themselves inside mm -hmm. Iraq, which was a, a terrible loss for Iraq, too, mm -hmm. and, and for the church, because these were, this was a unique church that prayed in the language of Jesus Christ, Aramaic. Um, it's lost forever. Uh, Dr. Ferris, before we wrap up here, give me your round robin of Afghanistan and what happens. Everyone say, well, now, well, we, we caught bin Laden. It's time to pull out of Afghanistan. Yeah, let's it's pull out quickly, pull out. and the Taliban's right. gonna come in quickly. I mean, you don't need to be able to science this to realize that the jihadists, if we don't help the Afghani and other populations to create a social change, a democratic change, what's going to happen basically is that the jihadists got to go move forward. Is that possible, given the mindset, given the culture of the region? Is, the, is democracy in an American style or even a European style, a Western style, possible? If the international community and the United States are going to continue to consider that the Muslim Brotherhood are their partners, then it's not going to be possible basically to reach out to the civil society side mm -hmm. of these populations and help them. That's the problem. Nina, you are on the International Religious Freedom uh, Commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is uh, uh, tied and tethered, however loosely, with the State Department. Are they listening? You have Frank Wolf proposing, he's proposed a bill to try to make the ambassador at large Special of international yeah. religious freedom directly responsible and answerable oh, to yeah. the Secretary of State. State yeah. You think that'll happen? Well, the commission that I'm on, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, is a watchdog commission. It's an independent government agency. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know. I don't know if the state, the State Department is not listening right now. And, and we're seeing this in the media, too. You're talking, you, you mentioned a blind spot. I, I was in disbelief. The New York Times were talking, writing about the Egypt situation and explicitly mm -hmm. said that this is not a religious issue. This is uh, a tribal issue or a, an yeah. economic issue with men fighting over jobs in Egypt where, mm. last weekend. And what, what, to what do you attribute that? Is that? Do you think that's just a nervousness? People don't want to deal with religion or realize that maybe religion is a motivating factor in these genocides we're seeing? Unfortunately, in my sense, it goes back to the classroom, to the American classroom. Oh. We have had for 20 to 30 years petrodollar funded Middle Eastern studies, which basically wipe out completely the issue of Middle Eastern minorities in general mm -hmm. and Christian in particular. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the phones before we run out of time. Steve from Rhode Island, what's your question? Hello, thank you. What can we do as lay Catholics to bring this uh, plight of the Christians in the Middle East uh, to the attention of our local congressmen and senators. What specifically can we do? Okay, good question. Uh, well, you have to, uh, you put your finger on it, you have mm -hmm. to uh, contact your le elected officials because they are responsible to you. Let Congress know you want hearings on this issue. You want aid, uh, maybe conditioned on on, the, on um, allowing Christians to build churches in Egypt on the same basis that Muslims can build mosques mm -hmm. in Egypt, that their identity cards should not identify them by faith because they will be targeted and persecuted with that. Uh, we have an email from Marianne from Philadelphia, and basically what she's writing, it's a long email, but she's saying that this persecution of Christians has been tolerated for a long time, even under Mubarak. That was indeed the case, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. Under Mubarak, there was a series of persecution. Mm -hmm. it, there were two things. There was the Mubarak laissez-faire of this persecution. Right. There were the Muslim Brotherhood putting pressure on the Cobbs, and there were the jihadi Salafists attacking them. Mm. Now Mubarak is out. You have two more pressures against the Cobbs. It's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible situation. Uh, should we pull all of our aid, the billions of dollars that go to Pakistan, given that they may have been shielding bin Laden all this time? 
have a different equation. I would say there are many people in Pakistan who are anti-jihadists. The current government is made of the People's Party who has been targeted. Benazir Bhutto was killed mm -hmm. and others. I would say we need to reshape that foreign aid. We don't mm -hmm. send packages anymore. We talk to them. You reform the ISR, the intelligence service, mm -hmm. you get the foreign aid. Aha. Uh -huh. So give, uh, conditions should be tied Absolutely. to the aid. Mm -hmm. Nina, final question. Well, should there be a religious engagement? Is that part of the answer here or perhaps the missing part of the equation where you have leaders, I guess like the Pope, he's the only man standing at this point, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, or Pope Shenouda, poor Pope Shenouda, the, the, the Coptic uh, Pope, mm -hmm. they, they, they're, they're openly calling for a prosecution of he in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. What should happen there? How should religious communities be involved in this? Well, I think the, the starting point is that we should educate ourselves. The religious mm -hmm. community's got to understand that there are Christians there. These have been there for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. And understand really what their, their faith tradition is and who they are and where they are. And then they should pray. And then I think that the best thing they can do at this point is to um, contact their elected officials. I think that that is, um, I think the United States has a lot of leverage if it chooses to use it. Mm -hmm. If I may ahead, add Bobby. one little thing to American Catholics and American Christians, invite speakers from the persecuted communities to your churches. Mm -hmm. You have a huge, you know, uh, space for discussion. Invite mm -hmm. them to your Catholic schools, to your Christian yep. schools, and from there, send those letters to the legislators. Yeah, then you'll really inside. understand Absolutely. that situation Absolutely, you have millions of people inside. waiting for that message. Dr. Yeah. Walid Faraz, Nina Shea, thank you both for thank being you. here. Fascinating discussion. Up next, are you happy? Father Jonathan Morris will tell you how to find true happiness, and I'll be taking notes. You should be, too, when the world of her life continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. My next guest is the news analyst for the Fox News Channel and the parochial vicar at Old St. Patrick's Cathedral, now a basilica in New York. He's also the author of a new book, God Wants You Happy, From Self-Help to God's Help, here to tell us about true happiness and what it takes to achieve it. Please welcome Father Jonathan Morris. Raymond, Great to you. see you. It's been a long time. Um, I want to first talk about the book, and then we'll talk about some sure. contemporary issues. Uh, this is really an anti-self-help book that becomes a self-help book, isn't it? You know, there's so much of the self-help industry today that has severed itself off from any relationship with God, and therefore preaches the fact that we alone can find our own happiness, and that we don't need anything else. Mm -hmm. I do believe there is room for self-help if by self-help we mean that we are tapping into the natural mechanisms that God has given to us mm -hmm. to improve who we are. But even if we do everything right, even if we do the perfect diet, even if we fix all our relationships, that's not the type of happiness or the degree of happiness that God wants us for that we could call beatitude, deep spiritual joy or fulfillment. What about those who simply, and this is more often the case, mm. those who simply don't want God's help. Mm. They don't want the moral strings that come with that help. They simply want to kind of, they want a devotional practice that is secular, which is what the self-help sure. industry really is, isn't it? You know, God is so patient with all of us. All of these people and even us at different times in our lives, when we say, I don't want God's help. Mm -hmm. If I were God, my reaction would be, hey, buddy, I created you. What are you thinking? Mm -hmm. He's so patient with us. And I think he is like that hound of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. The poem of Francis, Francis Thompson, Thompson, right? Yeah. Who's pursuing us. Even when we're trying to look for him all over the place in wrong places, he's there. And he's giving us moments of grace along the way to say, not only do I want happiness for you, but I am going to show you a path toward it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a question for Father Jonathan, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S., internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, World over at EWTN.com. We'll try to get to all your wanting happiness questions. Uh, Father, in the book, you, talk, you relate a story about how the idea mm -hmm. and the notion for this book came about. Uh, it has something to do with a butcher in the neighborhood, uh, and I think I know the butcher shop. Is that right? So go ahead. Why? Well, I'm at uh, Old St. Patrick's Cathedral, as you mentioned, and it's right, Little Italy, Chinatown, Soho, 
uh, um, all of these neighborhoods that come together. And I think all of us have had an experience in which we meet somebody who is just spirit filled, mm -hmm. who may not be having a perfect you know, situation in their lives. This butcher is like the last of the butchers because Whole Foods came yeah. in and all these other big gross, but he's there barely making it, but gosh, he's a happy guy. Mm -hmm. um, and I walked in there and he said, you know, Father, here's your meat for, you know, and I knew he can't afford this. Mm -hmm. This is, and I, what I try to show in the book is here's a path forward, okay? There's, there's certain things that we can do, but then there's also ways that we can tap into what I call the divine cure of faith, hope, and love, and how mm -hmm. to do that. And I think uh, God is waiting for us to tap into it. And I've seen so many people in tough marriages come out better for it, who are mm -hmm. the cops right now. Right? Mm -hmm. What is what, where's happiness there? Yeah. God can give them graces to become better people okay. in the midst of the persecution. So, so why do you think people are so unhappy? What is the root yeah. cause? I mean, you're a priest. You talk to people sure. every day. Well, of course, we have to, we have to distinguish between, distinguish between types of happiness. Right. You know, if somebody is deathly sick, mm -hmm. they're not going to say, "Gosh, I'm so happy. I feel so yeah. good." Yeah. But certainly there are, there are things in our lives that are challenges and difficulties that we can overcome using human intelligence, mm -hmm. but also then tapping into our spiritual life, connecting with God through prayer and finding purpose and reason even within our suffering. Mm -hmm. It's that type of serenity and spiritual joy that God wants for us. T tell me then, how, do you, how, how would you advise people to create, you talk about it as a process here. Mm. How, what process would you recommend to people if they're sure. trying to get rid of the junk in their lives, to see clearly, and to figure out what God intends for them? Because as you say in the book, God's ultimate end is for our happiness, but that happiness may not be how we conceive right. of it. Well, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life in abundance. Mm -hmm. So we can be confident, confident that he wants it. And then he also shows us how to do it. The Ten Commandments are a good, way to, a good place to start. John the Baptist, he would go out and he'd preach, and he's basically he said such simple things. He was like, mm -hmm. change what you know you need to change. Do what you know you need to do. And that's a great preparation. Then, of course, there's a whole life of the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, tapping into them, and mm -hmm. I try to lay out a, a plan mm -hmm. for, for doing that. Now, you, you talk in here about fear can actually prevent you mm. from being happy. Talk about yeah. that, because I know a lot of people, they're, they're, they're fearful, they're worried about finances, they're worried about their job, they're worried about the boss, they're worried about something. And, and, and that can have its own weight that crushes right. innovation, God's inspiration, and, and, and really finding the, the ultimate path that you're called to. That's right, Raymond. I, I even explained that, especially women, not only, but especially oh. women. I know this is dangerous. <laughs> Listen to this. Send the email. Listen you understand to this. me? Especially, especially women suffer th from fear and anxiety. From men. <laughs> and men, you know what we suffer from most? Shame. Mm. And we run from shame. It's another form of fear and, exi and yeah. anxiety, yeah. quite honestly. But shame. Oh my gosh, I lost my job. I'm not worth anything. Right. Right? Running away from shame. And the theological virtue of hope heals mm. our memory. Okay? Mm -hmm. Faith heals our intellect. Love heals our will. The theological virtue of, of hope heals our memory and says, mm -hmm. even though we've messed up in the past, even though that happened to me when I was a kid, God can be faithful. God will be faithful mm -hmm. to his promises. We have to tap into that. Yeah. And you're not talking. The thing I loved about the book, uh, this is not some yippy skippy answer coming from nothing. One gets the feeling as you read the book, and it's right, it's almost at the very center. Mm. You talk about your own path. And the mm. last time you were on this program, on a slightly different set, um, it was a very uncomfortable night because the news wow. had just broken that Father Maciel, the founder of the religious uh, institute that you were a part of, religious community, um, all of his transgressions had become public knowledge and they were pretty ugly That's in, right. in a number of ways. I'm going to read this little excerpt from the sure. book. You say, um, the one who invited, uh, uh, putting aside any personal judgment of his personal culpability, for only God can read a person's heart. What I do know is that my first spiritual father, the one who invited me to join the religi religious congregation he founded and who encouraged me along the way for many years was in fact a serial pedophile, a plagiarist, legal imposter, mostly absent father of several illegitimate children and a manipulator of biblical proportions. How do you recover 
from something right. like I, that. I, I remember getting so many emails from people who said, oh my gosh, you looked like you're dying up on that set. Yeah, and I, and yeah, I was yeah, at a certain yeah. level. But God has been faithful to his promises to me too. Mm -hmm. um, I made the choice to, to uh, move out of the congregation and part of the Archdiocese of New York now. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also guys who have decided to stay and be a part of the process of reform that, John, that Pope Benedict has called for. But you um, said, I, I'm not called to dedicate my priesthood to the profound revision, purification, and redefinition of the Legion of Christ that the Pope has, right. has yeah, called I, for. I didn't Why feel not? called to that. I think everyone has a very personal path. And quite honestly, I felt that um, this was a, a new step that God was inviting me to take. 17 years, a long yeah, time. You know what? But I received so many community. blessings from that, so many blessings from the people involved, so many blessings um, in the work that I did. And I really hope for the very best for them. And mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't know why I, God permitted that I ended mm -hmm. up with the Legionaries of Christ. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of good has come from, from it. And that, I think, is a proof that God can bring good out of terrible, terrible How evil. close were you to Father Masio? I knew him personally. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, you you were very. I mean, you, you were with him all the time, weren't you in Rome? No, I mean, you, but you no, saw him fairly regularly. First of all, I don't think anybody knew him mm -hmm. very well. No indication. Not a, and me personally, not a yeah. single indication. And I don't know if that's the case with everyone, mm -hmm. but um, I never even, never even guessed, um, even the slightest hint. Looking back on it, I should have been more critical, mm -hmm. and I apologize also in this book for all of the people yeah. who were hurt because we didn't believe their stories. Those who were abused, those who, were, who, who said, this is what happened to me, and we said, mm -hmm. no, it couldn't have been because we've seen this and this. We should have seen it. We should have said it. We didn't. I personally apologize, and I know mm -hmm. uh, the order has as well. Do you think there's a bit of that, um, if you will, knee-jerk defensiveness even now? By, on in the, the, the in, Within the Legion? Yes, but I think it is changing. Mm -hmm. What would you say to Father Maceo if he were here tonight? I would uh, hope only for the best for, for him. I would hope only for the best. At this point, obviously, judgment has uh, been had. And been rendered, so I, yeah. I don't think anything I would say to him now would, would Could change that, that right? Yeah. Um, but um, I pray for mercy, but I also pray for mercy for those who suffered um, mm -hmm. on, on, on his behalf. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it, it was a tragic and, and tumultuous thing that people are still going through, we should say. Members of Regnum Absolutely. Christi and the Legion, and, and you know, we should also say, as you know better than most, there are, there are really good people who, who uh, were caught up in all of this. And, um, That's right. And, 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 and Pope Benedict has, has, uh, has done the order good in um, providing such close uh, follow-up. He must believe mm -hmm. that something good something very good can come out of this. I want to shift gears for a moment and talk about the story we're seeing today. Uh, several Catholic academics from a variety of Catholic institutions, universities, writing an open letter to John Boehner. He's giving the commencement address here at Catholic University this weekend. That's right. And in response to that, they're saying, you know, you may consider yourself a Catholic, but your record on the poor is beneath Catholic teaching and a break with Catholic teaching. Your thoughts on this letter and what's motivating it? Well, they're specifically concerned about uh, the budget proposals coming out of the Republicans right now. Mm -hmm. um, and the thesis is, I think, and I think this is wrong, is that um, any cut to current um, levels of funding mm -hmm. for social programs that help the poor is anti-Catholic. That's the thesis. Right. If you cut this because it negatively affects the poor, you're anti-Catholic. Mm -hmm. Notice that the president of, the, of Catholic University didn't sign on to it. Mm -hmm. Notice that the vice president didn't sign on to it. Notice not a single bishop signed on to this. Right. And so, yes, there's a group of academics who are saying, Boehner, you're anti-Catholic, but I think support to him. He also have to, has to recognize that this is a prudential decision that belongs to politicians mm -hmm. to apply the social doctrine of the church to policy. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it's that cut, cut and dry at all. Yeah, yeah uh, Father Sirico wrote a piece uh, today on his blog, and he said the church's magisterium does not wish to exercise political power or eliminate the freedom of opinion of Catholics regarding contingent questions. He said it could be said that these Catholic uh, academicians are proposing something. It's not a pre pre preferential option for the poor, but rather a preferential option for the state, a oh, government you know what? program. That's a great point. And I would say I would... I would, I would describe it a little bit differently. I would say 
the thought that the only person or the only entity that can help the, the poor, poor is the federal government mm -hmm. goes against a principle of Catholic doctrine called subsidiarity. Mm -hmm. it sh the federal government should enter only when the family has failed, only when the local community has failed, only when churches have failed. Mm -hmm. That's when the federal government comes in and provides a safety net, see, not the, the other way the around. The thing I find disturbing about all of this, it smells to me like a Sister Carol Kean moment. Mm. You remember Sister Carol Kean was the, the, the sister with a group of nuns who signed a letter supporting the president's health care plan in opposition to, in fact, in open defiance of the bishops of the United States, who are the appropriate teachers right. and representatives and uh, the, the, the ones who should be speaking on our behalf in the uh, on these moral questions. Uh, it, 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 it feels to me like a political operation again. The bishops, they couldn't get the bishops to condemn this budget or to right. shake a finger at faithful Catholics, both Paul Ryan and, and John Boehner. Yet, when we find ourselves in this position, we have to come up with some group of Catholics that right. oppose this budget, so we've created one. Right, and you know, if they win in the media, they win mm -hmm. in, in a lot of, in a, in to a great extent. Now, we should say Bishop Blair and Bishop Hubbard did come out and critique some of these cuts that were proposed. Yes, they did. Right, and, uh, and these, acad uh, these academics take that and then blow it up, making it look like all of the bishops mm -hmm. believe that the Democratic agenda is the Catholic agenda and the Republican agenda mm -hmm. or the proposed budget is evil. It's so dangerous because it's carving up people based on their political ideology. And personally, I think people, particularly younger people, they're less interested in that. They're much, right. you, you, have, you have much better, a much better opportunity to reach them in, as you are with this book, in mm -hmm. their spiritual lives, in the things that are universal and unite us. And once you educate them on these moral principles, then the politics will fall in line. Right. It is the failure, quite honestly, to, to to properly catechize and teach people the morality and what the church expects, that sure. I think has led to this breakdown and then, in and politics. And then, then we need other academics to be writing other letters, mm -hmm. describing a different point of view. Yeah. Um, and that's what it means for every Catholic to take on the universal call to holiness mm -hmm. as well as the call to evangelization and being an apostle. Uh, final question in our final minute. How, what, if you had one thing you could tell people that could lead them to true happiness, what would it be? Pray. How do you do that? You have a great plan, by the way, in the you, book. You, Quickly you tell me. You talk to God. You converse with God. You dialogue with God. You form a habit of talking about ordinary things, tough things, not just when you feel like it or when you're in desperate situations, but daily. And listening. That's part of prayer. Mm -hmm. No, you have a great, there's a great plan in here. You said, you know, go to a quiet place, you read a couple of lines of scripture mm. and reflect on that, and then, you know, that, and let that dialogue sort of take place. It's like you actually read this book, Raymond. Uh, you I'm see that? I'm quite impressed. I like, Not I, many... I like what you say. It's like you've actually read the book. God <laughs> wants you happy. Uh, from self-help to God's help, Father Jonathan Morris, thanks for Thank being you, here. Thank you, It's a great read. Uh, and the book is available through the EWTN Religious Catalog and at bookstores everywhere. And before we go, here's a little preview of the recently released film, There Be Dragons. Set during the Spanish Civil War, it tells the tale of two childhood friends who encounter tragedy and redemption. One of them even becomes a saint, Jose Maria Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei. Take a look. The hardest thing about playing this role, it's very easy to start trying to play pious. Someone who is just, at, at, you know, at total peace with the world and, and his circumstances and all that kind of stuff. And my worry was, was if, that, if I started to do that, then I'm going to isolate more people. I'm going to alienate more people from him because you're going to start, suddenly you're going to, what you're going to be seeing is you're going to be, especially for the people who aren't religious in any way, who, who maybe see this film. You don't want to suddenly show this extraordinary man, but, with, with, but playing him in such a way that people can then say, um, well, yeah, but he was a priest. Th 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 that's not it. I'm not trying to give a portrayal of what a priest is. I think we're trying to give an honest portrayal of, of, of who Jose Maria Scruba was. See, it's not, that, it's not that he did these things, some of these things. It's that he did them despite the immense doubt and fear that he was faced with and adversity that he was faced with. If we can relate that to our own lives, then the hope is that people will go away from this film and see a man who um, was able to access an extraordinary part of himself that we are perhaps all capable of doing.
Pussy, my dear. Oh, God. Quick! Quick, get the doctor! It's Jose Maria Escriva in the middle, and on the left, your father. Dad? I found out that you were in a seminary with Jose Maria Escriva. I warn you, leave it alone, Roberto. He knows something about Jose Maria. Your father is a product of difficult times. You should try to understand him. This is an announcement from your government. There has been a military uprising. I'm such a coward. Me too. Follow. They've started killing priests. We have to leave. It's suicide to stay. Now, especially now, we have to be source of peace. That costume of yours won't protect you anymore. I don't wear this for protection. Jose Maria, the truth is, we are born alone and we die alone. All we have in between is suffering. I know what it is to be angry at life. Please be careful where that leads you, Mano. Not one of us is free from human weakness. There Be Dragons is in theaters everywhere. And before we go, I have to thank a, a pal. This is Jack Heretic. Jack has been our right-hand man here at the John Paul II Center, and he's leaving us. He's a Sorry. Catholic University student, almost graduated, but this is his last night with the show, and we're very upset. Thank you, Jack, for all your help. Thank you, his family's here tonight, so uh, we say hi and thank you to them as well. That's all the time we have until next week. You can find updates and the occasional commentary by following me on Twitter or on my fan book, Facebook fan page, not my fan book, though I'd like a fan about now the air is out in this room. Just go to RaymondArroyo.com. You can click through from there. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching, and I hope the air conditioner returns next week. Bye now. <laughs>